Okay, so we're going to look in this video, to start with we're going to look at mass and weight, then we're going to look at more forces more generally, and finally we're going to finish off by looking at Hooke's law, how objects behave when you try and change their shape. Okay, so if we start with mass and weight, so first of all when we say mass, what do we mean? Well, the general kind of physics definition for this is we say mass is the quantity of matter inside an object. And that doesn't really tell you an awful lot about what mass really means. So I'm going to break it into two categories because mass has influence in two areas of physics. The first one is what we call inertia. So the more massive an object is, which means if that object has more mass contained within it, it's harder for a force to change its motion. And the ways we think about changing motion, changing its direction or changing the speed that it's traveling at. So the amount of resistance an object has to changes in its motion is what we call inertia. So more mass, mass of an object, the more inertia we say it has. The other aspect of physics that mass affects is gravity because things with mass have gravitational fields around them which interact with each other. So the more massive an object is the stronger the gravitational field is around it which means when another object enters that field it will exert a larger weight force on it. Uh, so we can dig into this idea of uh, gravitational fields a little bit more. So uh, we draw gravitational fields around the object. So this shows which direction a mass would experience a force. And these field diagrams also give you an indication of how strong a field is. So how close these lines are together tells you how strong the field is. So uh, for the Earth, we can see the field lines are close together. That indicates its gravitational field is stronger than that of the moon. And the reason for that is the Earth is much more massive than the moon is. Um, you can also see that the further from an object you get, the further apart these field lines are on the diagrams. And what that does is that indicates the gravitational field gets weaker with distance, but it never actually gets to zero. Gravity is what we call an infinite range force. Uh, it extends as far across the universe as you want. Uh, so those of you who want to find out a bit more about uh, the gravitational force, you might want to pause and actually look up about Newton's law of gravitation, which models this really well. Um, another thing I'd like to flag up is a really interesting video I watched about actually why do objects have mass? What causes objects to have mass? And there's a really interesting video from the Royal Institution that actually explores that, so I would definitely recommend that one. Okay, so grab like I said earlier, the interaction of two gravitational fields leads to weight forces, and I do say forces plural. So when you get two fields overlapping, like the field for the Earth and the field for the Moon, those two objects will exert equal and opposite weight forces on each other. And you can see them on the diagram, so they're the same size arrows. So you can see the Moon is exerting a weight force on the Earth, and the Earth is exerting a weight force on the Moon. Those two are equal and opposites. And the closer the objects are, and the bigger their masses are, the larger the weight forces, which is why the weight force on the Earth from the Sun is much bigger because the Sun is much more massive. It's about a million times the mass of the Earth. Okay, so we get these pairs of forces. Okay, so let's now go down a scale. So the way I've been talking so far is kind of on a very large scale, looking at a universe or solar system level. Once we get down onto a planet, we model weight forces a little differently. So on the left, you can see how we think about the gravitational field around the Earth on a solar system kind of level. We can see we have the field strength decreasing the further from the planet you get. Once we're on the scale of sort of planet, so looking at things on the surface of a planet, the gravitational field strength doesn't really change very much um, as you increase in height, unless you go really far away. So what we do is we model the a uh, gravitational field on the surface of a planet as approximately a constant field strength. And on Earth, it has the value of 9.81 newtons per kilogram, but we usually just use the number 10. 
And what this number means is if an object has a mass of one kilogram, the Earth will cause it to have a weight force of 10 newtons. And therefore, consequently, that object exerts a 10 newton force on the Earth as well. OK, so uh, just to formalize this into an equation, we say that weight force W is equal to mass times the gravitational field strength, which we assign the symbol G. And on Earth, that's 10. And on like Jupiter, I think it's about 26. On the moon, it's about 1.4. So that varies from planet to planet. But once we get onto the surface of the planet, we model this field strength as being constant. OK, so we are often interested in measuring objects mass or measuring objects weight. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to flag up is we actually can't really measure an object's mass very easily. What we're often doing is measuring an object's weight force and then we calculate what the mass is from that. And that's what a spring balance or a mass balance does. So well, when we first put an object on a balance, we call the bit on the top the pan. So what happens is the weight force of the object acts to compress the springs inside the balance. And as you try and compress something, it starts to resist you compressing it. That's what we call a compression force. So to start with, the weight force is much bigger than that. So it actually compresses the springs and shortens their length. Now, eventually what happens is the pan becomes stationary. And at that point, um, the compression forces are going to be equal to the weight force. So they're going to cancel each other out. And that eventually what's going to happen is the, the pan becomes stationary. It does oscillate up and down a little bit until it reaches this point. Uh, but eventually we get this balanced situation. And by measuring the change in length, that delta L that's marked on the diagram, we can actually calculate what the weight force is. And therefore, once we know the weight force, we can divide it by 10. And that gives us the mass of the object, which is how it outputs it in grams or kilograms or whatever. OK, so that's a balance. So we're going to go a bit more broad now. So we were just specifically looking at mass and weight forces. We're going to take a step back and just look at forces in general and what they do, because it's forces that cause pretty much everything in physics. This is the cause of everything. So one thing they can do is change the speed of an object. So if a force acts parallel to the direction of objects travel, so we can see on the diagrams, the objects are traveling to the right. The V is actually a symbol for velocity, which we'll come to in the next video. So in the diagram on the left, we can see the force and the velocity or the direction of motion are in the same direction. And because they are parallel and in the same direction, that force is going to act to increase the speed of the object. It's not going to change its direction in any way. Whereas the one on the right, it's still parallel to the motion, but it's in the opposite direction. So that's going to act to decrease the speed of the object. But again, it's not going to change its direction. OK, so that's about forces and speed. If we apply the force perpendicularly to the direction of objects travel, so we can see in this diagram, the velocity or the direction of travel is marked going upwards and the force is at 90 degrees or perpendicular to it. This force is going to act to change the direction of the object, but not the speed. Uh, so we're kind of the opposite of what we just had. And to think a bit more broadly, if the force is neither parallel or perpendicular, what that means is that could change both the speed and the direction of the object. Uh, that's what happens if we don't have the conditions we've seen so far. OK, so the last thing forces can do is actually change the shape of an object like we saw with the mass balance. So in order to change the shape of an object, you need a pair of equal magnitude forces. And equal magnitude just means the same size. So they're both 20 newtons or they're both 100 newtons. But they need to be acting in opposite directions like you can see in the diagram. And when we have that situation, they won't change the direction of travel. They won't change the speed, but they will change the shape. So in this scenario, we can see they've acted to decrease the length. We can have a pair of forces that act to increase the length. And we can have object uh, forces which act to shear or actually change the shape of an object. But uh, that comes much later in physics, really. OK, so that's our changing shape. So 
a general rule of thumb to kind of have in your head is the more a force changes the shape of an object, so in this example, the more we compress an object, the harder the object will resist any further change. So or the, another way of saying that is you get a bigger what we call compression force acting out against you. And that is true right up until the point where you actually break the object. So we actually break bonds in the material or something like that. Um, but it's a good rule of thumb to have in your head. So we can explore that idea in a bit more depth. And there's a law which governs it or formalizes it named after Robert Hooke. It says the extension of a material is directly proportional to the force applied to extend it, but this only works up to what we call the limit of proportionality, and that's the point where we actually start changing the structure and breaking the bonds of the material. Okay, so this one, we're stretching a spring. So its original length we call L0, that's the symbol I'm going to use. We then apply two forces outwards to stretch it to a new extended length L. And what Hooke's law says is the extension, or delta L, is directly proportional to the force that we're applying, or forces that we're applying to stretch it. And we know we've hit the limit of proportionality where Hooke's law stops working when the force versus extension graph, which we can draw, stops being a straight line or stops being directly proportional. So let's actually look at that. So we've got force against extension here, and we can see for quite a period of time, or for quite a lot of forces, uh, that is a directly proportional relationship. But we can see towards the top, it stops being directly proportional, so it's stopped obeying Hooke's law anymore. Um, so the gradient of the straight line section is what we call the stiffness constant of the material or the force required to change the length by one meter. So a larger stiffness constant, and occasionally you'll see it uh, expressed as spring constant, is another word we use for it, means it's harder to change the shape of an object. So a steeper gradient on this graph means that object, for some reason, has a bigger resistance to you changing its shape, or a smaller gradient means it's more easy to change the shape of that material. Okay, so that concludes this video on mass, weight, forces, and Hooke's law. Uh, my next video is going to be on the motion of objects, so speed, acceleration, resultant force.